Hi, and welcome. I will introduce you to some of the basic terms and concepts of statistics in this video. We will cover basic terms like population, objects characteristics, data, population parameters, samples, and sample statistics. We will also learn to differentiate between descriptive and inferential statistics. We will see whether sample statistics can be trusted, and some of the pitfalls. And finally, how to draw a representative sample from the population, using random and stratified random sampling techniques. First, we look at what a population is. A population contains the entire collection of objects a study is interested in. The objects can be people, animals, plants, products. The population size can be as large as millions or billions, or as small as tens or hundreds. A study that involves the population is called a census. Now we look into some characteristics and data of objects, for example people, which we may be interested. A characteristic of people is weight, and a datum could be 58.2 kilogram. Other characteristics of people of interest could be height, BMI which is derived from weight and height. Gender Race Marital status Age and so on These data can be obtained by measuring, counting, asking, observing, or computing. If you collect the data that describe the characteristics of all the objects in the population, you have the population data. Summaries derived from the population data are called parameters. Some common examples of parameters are population size, denoted by capital letter N, population mean, denoted by Greek letter mu, and the formula is as shown. Population variance denoted by the Greek letter sigma square. Population standard deviation, denoted by sigma and is the square root of population variance. Population proportion, denoted by P. There is only one true value for each of these parameters, but most of these true values are usually unknown, and can be estimated using sample data. We will talk about what sample and sample data are in later slides. The following are examples of population studies. 1. We wish to investigate mean BMI of senior citizens aged 60 and above. This would involve measuring the weights and heights of all senior citizens, compute their BMIs, and then compute the average of these BMIs. This would be a very tedious and impractical task to do. 2. We wish to know the proportion of primary school students in Singapore who are myopic. This would involve counting the total number of primary school students currently in Singapore, and the number of them who are myopic. The ratio of the number of students who are myopic, over total number of students, would be the proportion, or percentage, of students who are myopic. Again, this is a tedious task to do. Next, we look at what a sample is. A sample is a subset of objects drawn from the population of interest in a study. The sample size is denoted by small letter n. The sample size is usually much smaller than the population size. It is important to determine the sample size needed before collecting the data. While summaries of population data are called parameters, summaries of sample data are called statistics. Some common examples of statistics are, sample size, denoted by small letter n. Sample mean, denoted by x bar and the formula is as shown. Sample variance, denoted by S square. Sample standard deviation, denoted by S, and is the square root of sample variance. Sample proportion, denoted by P cap. We can draw many different samples from the population of interest. Hence, unlike population parameters which have only one true value each, different samples are likely to give you different sample statistics. For example, we draw two different samples of senior citizens of size n from the population. We compute the mean BMI of the senior citizens for both samples. The two sample means for BMI are likely to be close to each other but very unlikely to be exactly the same. 
statistics can be broadly classified into two branches. Descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics describe three things about the given data. 1. The central tendency of the given data. Where the center point is located, usually described by the, the mean, the median, and the mode. 2. The dispersion or spread of the given data. How close together or how far apart the given data are, from the smallest to the largest values. 3. The shape of the spread or distribution of the given data. Whether the shape is symmetrical or skewed to the right or left. Whether the spread is bell-shaped, flat or sharply peaked. Inferential statistics use sample statistics derived from sample to estimate population parameters. Compare for significant differences between two or more population parameters. Test for relationship between variables and make prediction. For example, looking at the starting salaries of 888 fresh diploma graduates do not give you much useful information. We use descriptive statistics to better describe the given data. The horizontal x-axis of the dot diagram represents salary. The vertical y-axis represents the frequency or count of the number of fresh diploma graduates earning that salary. Each square represents the salary of one fresh diploma graduate. For central tendency, we can see that the mode salary, that is salary with the highest frequency, is about $1,600. The mean and median salary is also around this value. For dispersion, we can see the salaries spread from a low of $1,050 to a high of $2,600, but almost all are between $1,250 and $1,950. The low $1,050 and a few salaries higher than $2,000 are unusual salaries or could be outliers or extreme values. For shape, we can see the distribution of the salary is skewed right and sharply peaked. These observations can be confirmed from the sample statistics. We will learn to interpret them in later chapter. In inferential statistics, we use sample statistics as point estimates of population parameters. For example, the sample mean starting salary of the 888 fresh diploma graduates is $1,606. We conclude that the population mean starting salary of all the fresh diploma graduates is also $1,606. We also use the sample statistics to compare means. For example, we compare the mean starting salaries of male and female diploma graduates. We want to find out whether the difference in starting salaries of male and female graduates is significant. We also use sample data to find relationship between variables and make prediction. For example, we want to predict the starting salary of a new diploma graduate given his her GPA score. The big question is, how good are these sample statistics to make inference about the population parameters? Can we really trust these sample statistics? You must have heard that famous saying from an American writer Mark Twain, even you may not know him. There are three kinds of lies. Lies. Damned lies. And statistics. But truly, statistics don't lie. Human does, either intentionally or unintentionally. Intentionally to manipulate data, or for personal gain. Unintentionally, due to inappropriate data collection methods. Due to poor questionnaires due to non-representative or biased samples, or due to other reasons. All these lead to bad statistics. Examples of inappropriate data collection methods. We all know good personal hygiene is the best way to fight variant H1N1 influenza. But how many of us practice good personal hygiene? How many of you do not wash your hands after using the toilet? Can I have a show of hands please? This is definitely an appropriate way to collect data. No one will put up their hands. Maybe you can pose as a cleaner and observe how many people do not wash their hands after using the toilet or do an anonymous survey. The results may be more accurate and truthful. Also, when you have a very pretty or very handsome interview or conducting face-to-face -face interview or survey, the responses from interviewees may be very different. Examples of poor questionnaires 
with so many people out of job, do you think the government is doing enough to help the people in this current economic crisis? This is what we call a leading question. By suggesting that so many people are out of job, the question subtly prompts the respondent to answer the question in a negative way. How can the government be doing enough when there are so many people out of job? The question can be rephrased to be more neutral and ask the respondent opinion on what the government has done instead. Another example of poor questionnaire. Do you get along well with your colleagues? This question put the respondent in defensive mode. Of course I get along super well with all my colleagues. Examples of non-representative or biased samples. A class project requires the students to do a survey on the mode of transport to schools used by secondary school students in Singapore. Project team conveniently interview their classmates and schoolmates as expected. The problems, the students are from a rich man's school. A large percentage of the students not only go to school by cars, but in big cars. The results of the survey are probably not representative of the population because the sample is biased. Online internet surveys, such as using SurveyMonkey, are getting more popular. Such surveys are limited to people who are have access to the internet and are usually more computer savvy. You will definitely not get a representative sample if you are do a survey on wet markets using this approach. We have to be aware of people who intentionally manipulate data to mislead. And be more careful and critical when we look at statistics. Data collection methods and questionnaires can be improved with proper training and experience. And the most important issue, we want a representative sample. What is a representative sample? In a population with unknown population parameters, we draw a sample of size n. Compute the sample statistics and use them as estimates of the population parameters. Are these sample statistics good representatives of the population parameters? It generally depends on two things, one, how the sample is drawn from the population. A random sample may be representative of the population. Two, the sample size n. Usually larger sample sizes gives better estimates and less variability among estimates. For example, how would you draw a random sample to estimate the mean allowance of secondary schools pupils in Singapore? Drawing 200 pupils from a rich man's school will not give you a representative sample of the population. How can you draw a representative sample of the population? As mentioned earlier, a random sample may be representative of the population. So what is a random sample? By definition, a random sample of size n is drawn from the population in such a way that every member of the population has an equal chance of being included in the sample. Or, every possible combination of n members from the population has an equal chance of be selected. However, we have to take note that a random sample may be representative of the population most of the time, but not all the time. Also, in practice, it is difficult to draw a random sample from the population because, very often, we do not have access to the entire population. Sometime, we not only wish to have a random sample, we want to have a stratified random sample. A stratified random sample has proportional representations for each group or stratum. For example, a population may consist of 50% male and 50% female. A random sample drawn from the population theoretically, should also consist of 50% male and 50% female. In practice, this usually does not happen, especially for smaller sample sizes. To ensure proportional representations for each group or stratum, male and female, we use stratified random sampling technique. We divide the populations into groups or strata, such as male group and female group, and draw random sample from each group according to the proportions. This can be applied to other characteristics as well, such as race, age group, religion, and educational level. Thank you for watching the video.